<laughs> okay. Yeah. Sound. Thank you. <laughs> so good Sorry to about know. that. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, let's see. Okay, here we are. On the right, similarly, I have deconstructed costume jewelry to reuse the antique plastic foil back gems that, um, and that one's fabricated from all sterling silver. Uh, I completed my undergrad at Appalachian State and I got to participate in the radical jewelry makeover in 2012. That experience deeply informed my blossoming interest in jewelry design and ethical metal smithing practices, and eventually led me to study at VCU with Susie Gonch. My work, even from those earliest days, was concerned with repurposing throwaway materials. And although I didn't realize it at the time, I was and still am influenced by costume jewelry designs, especially from the mid-century modern era. I have a healthy practice as a picker, meaning that much of my creativity comes from the material culture that I acquire through thrifting, antiquing, estate sales, ground scores, and sometimes online bidding. My space is packed with the objects I curate from the world around me. On the right is a picture of my jeweler's bench um, with only a sliver of the space that I'm so lucky, so lucky to have been working in through school. Here are some more pre-graduate school uh, pieces. I am very obviously a stone setter. That style of working has been very comfortable for me and is the easiest way I've found to integrate these um, found materials. On the left, again, is sterling silver with antique German glass, and the right is sterling silver with lucite plastic beads. And this is the last slide I'll show um, that has some of the earlier works. Here, I've just begun to dip my toes into what it means to make and wear subversive jewelry. All of these integrate found pin back buttons, each denoting different sub subcultures. Um, raunchy, edgy, taboo, mischievous, inappropriate, devilish. This series felt like home for me while I was sorting through how I wanted to orient myself as an art jeweler. The construction was very simple on these, mostly made out of um, mild steel, which was affording me the ability to work prolifically. Um, so I was, a I was collaging around found materials with, uh, sorry, I was collaging found materials around this feature prop, which was the pin back button. Um, during my first year in graduate school, I fell down some weird rabbit holes. Andy, who's sitting right here, um, um, and who shared that first year with me as he was exiting graduate school and I was just beginning, can attest to some of the weirdness. Um, during that time, I was researching about the American narrative jewelry movement. Storytelling is one of the most compelling features about art jewelry, in my opinion. And as a human who's paying attention to the world around me, I have stories to tell and absolutely use my work as a way to narrate my story. These three jewelry objects here are um, pieces that I created. Um, sorry. Uh, I lost my space. Okay. Oh, they're um, part of a series I produced uh, of biographical jewelry or jewelry made for specific people. Um, each piece of jewelry in this series was created for one of the 10 students in my cohort. The two that flanked the center work were for some of my peers and the center one was a self portrait. As you can see, I am fabricating in a way that is haphazard, crass, using these found materials acquired through my practice of collecting. I see these ex as expressions of DIY. There is certainly jewelry language here and technical proficiency. Um, I'm using my metal smithing knowledge as a way to engineer solutions to pull unlike materials into one object. And sometimes the path of least resistance, least resistance to creating a wearable object does not uh, involve over crafting a solution. By that, I mean, for those of us who are craftspeople, I think we tend to uh, have a desire to engineer something into a corner, maybe back based on craft neuroses. And I find that working style to be restrictive and time consuming. Um, so I want the freshness of process to be apparent in each object. This way of making is what led me to begin researching punk and its relationship to my process as a maker. These works were also created in my first year of graduate school. Um, here's where I shifted into autobiographical jewelry making. 
I was attempting to relate wearable objects to my story without words, um, using materials and processes that show evidence of action. In the piece on the left, the multi-layered fabric brooch, um, sorry, this is a multi-layered fabric brooch where I sat on the back stoop of my house and chain smoked cigarettes, putting out each cigarette on the brooch itself. Um, as a non-smoker who has lost several members of my family to COPD and who experienced cigarette burns in the fabrics around our house, I wanted to relate to the shame of some of those experiences through mirroring my actions against this object. Um, that is to say, each time I smushed out the cigarette, I was performing infliction on the space of the brooch that was worn above my heart. Um, each burn exposed deeper layers of fabrics. On the right, I did a similar performance, but the small swatches of fabric with the cigarette burns made a series of bizarre rings because I could fit my finger into the burn hole, um, much like how I had as a child. Both of these performances were a way I was experimenting with elevating shame, wearing my experiences as jewelry. In the center, this work is titled um, Portrait of an Unapologetic American. I created a steel chain netting that houses this Budweiser can that I found by the riverside with bullet holes pierced through it. Again, this work is narrative relating to my story, but also entitling it as I have, I'm relating it to an American attitude, an unapologetic way of existing and taking space. So now I'm going to shift gears um, and talk about what I'm currently doing and what I've explored during this residency. Um, above is a Jim Jarmusch quote I thought I'd use as a segue into talking about this current body of work. Nothing is original. Steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadow. Select only those things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. Don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you feel like it. Um, there's this really great article called This Body Is Not a Temple written by Christopher Corey Allen about the punk body that draws on queer theory, punk history, fluidity and anti-containment that has been resonant with me as I have embarked on creating what I am call, calling jewelry bootlegs. Um, so the installation space above um, and other installation spaces that I've created um, integrate what I have come to refer to as jewelry bootlegs, which are works that I create that are inspired homages to artists whose work I study, admire, and consider to be personally valuable. The creation of these bootlegs is a way that I'm offering access for others as well as myself to view art jewelry and artworks that can often feel inaccessible. The bootlegs are collaborative in a sense, similar to the way bootleg tape is recorded from an original, but by nature of being bootlegged has transformed into a new work with apparent sincerity of haptic naivety and the signature signs of crude reproduction processes. I see myself as part of an American, um, as part of a lineage of American narrative jewelers, and I view the bootleg as the ultimate form of Americana. This is the hinge pin for my thesis work. Um, so this is one of the other installations I created. Um, this installation is titled Shitfire Number One, and it's where I've begun to integrate these bootlegs into a messy swirling mash of chaos and information. The shitfire ring in the center is a Carl Fritsch bootleg. The mirror on the back wall is a Tony Matelli bootleg. Um, then there's the cardboard that's laid out into a composition uh, on the ground that was intended to refer to the cardboard series by Robert Rauschenberg created in the early 70s. The altar which makes the larger composition is referencing some of the photographic works by artist Nick Sethi who photographs people in places in modern day India. There are actual bootleg tapes in the, count, in the corner and a necklace of strung together found objects. Um, that was a nod to my favorite jeweler, Lisa Walker. Not only do I have these special bootlegs in the space, I've also integrated objects of personal significance to me. Um, I asked viewers to approach, to approach the altar with reverence, reserving, uh, 
sorry, observing the potency of each object as it was in relationship with the space. My hope was to create equanimity, sorry, equanimity between materials with vastly different uh, intrinsic values in hopes that it would generate an entry point and demystification of that which we don't understand, for example, eccentric art jewelry or have access to. I hoped to insert my own narrative into the space through ritual. In reality, I think I created a third thing, which was a space that was singularly unrelatable, not in a bad way, but just in a way. The left here and the center are both bootlegs I made of Lynn Batchelder's work. For those of you who know Lynn's work, which I've pictured on the right, you might think what I've created is distinctly unlike what you've seen of her work. I'm um, really inter interested in that slippage. Again, related to the Allen reading, they state, a punk body acknowledges its own slippage. The term um, bootleg has an interesting history and etymology. And although I won't go into detail here, um, every iteration of bootlegging from its inception as poor people were stealing from the aristocracy by shoving valuables into their tall boots in order to bypass Coast Guard checkpoints to how I use it now, it relates to finding that loophole where you can ex uh, acquire access to cultural objects that you desire but cannot afford. I wanted to create relatability to Lynn Batchelder's work, so I used pedestrian materials. Um, the black that you see there is cut tar paper, um, whereas Lynn uses silver and steel. I wanted to embrace the sloppy, the amateur, the crude as forms of success and as tools to reclaim power. Instead of sleek black backplates, these forms reveal cutouts from a Bike Week magazine from the 80s. Um, relative to the punk ethos I've described in this jewelry, I created an abject version from the original thing. Um, the irony of working in this way is that the bootlegs become distinctly unbootleggish. I see that as another form of that slippery punk body. Have you ever collaborated with a friend or an artist and in the process you thought I would do that differently? Um, the same is happening to me. I intend to make a bootleg of a specific artist's work or by mimicking their signature marks and end up derailing my own plans by deciding against the integrity of the design I'm bootlegging. Then the forms become hybridized, which relates them to the lineage of craft. Above is a brooch I made during my month at the BJC. Um, and I made it with Bettina Speckner in mind, whose image is pictured on the right. The, um, through conversations with Susie, we, we started to realize how readily lineage slippage and misinterpretation came into play during this process. The attitude with which I produced this work was conceptually divergent from Speckner's and became more allied to the other artists by happenstance. Um, then the viewer may see the work and misunderstand my interpretation, again, relating to that reading in discussion about the relationship between punk and low theory. Low theory is a way of embracing failure as a counterintuitive way to inhabit the refusal of mastery and success. What I've come to learn through this process are a number of things. First, generating prolifically helps me to work out not only how I will land on the co collaboration, but also how I'll acquire the skills that I've not formerly had. Each maker works in a really different way, so inhabiting others' working styles takes practice. Um, the left two uh, images here are mine, um, and they're bootlegs of Stephanie Verhoff's work. Obviously, the piece on the far left is the bootleg. But this, but this style of working inspired me to make the work in the center. Both are cast with these alternative forms of prong settings. But in the center, I got excited to integrate found, uh, sorry, fabricated elements into the design and see how the contrast layered against the bootlegged design. Through this process, I um, have learned to give myself permission to explore and satisfy those cravings that I have that often diverge from the strictest of bootlegging terms. Also, uh, maybe this should be noted as one of the biggest breakthroughs I had in my time at the BJC. Uh, as I made more of these bootlegs, I need to determine how, I, how my creative choices can 
fulfill my desire of access building. Meaning if I wanted to make it more affordable to wear a Lola Brooks ring, then when I create a bootleg, I have to make sure to use materials that are more cost effective, similarly to how costume jewelry is an affordable version of couture fashion jewelry. As you can see, the Lola Brooks work is pictured in the center here. I'm compelled by her pillowy ring designs. Um, the two designs that flank hers are mine and they're my first attempts at capturing a bit of the Lola Brooks magic. I'm not afraid to say when I think I'm not necessarily hitting the mark with some of these, although I find them compelling in their own uniqueness. I don't think they're doing the thing I'm asking them to do. I'm also um, beginning to explore utilizing materials that are, um, sorry, as I'm beginning to utilize these less expensive materials, I'm also looking at how to create access through the lens of relatability. Um, one way of exploring that is through materials. By this, I mean um, that there are certain materials that we encounter daily. And because of that, we have certain associations and comforts with those materials such things as steel, aluminum, yellow pine, plastic, um, tape, a cotton t-shirt. These are materials that I'd say we have more interaction with on average than gold or sapphires, for example. Another way that I'm exploring that is through um, bootlegging objects outside of the art jewelry universe. Um, so before I had some, um, in those installations, I had some sculptural bootlegs. And then also I'm um, sourcing these bootlegs that you see here through alternative cultural spaces. I'm excited about the possibilities that these, um, that works of this variety can offer the art jewelry bootlegs. My hope being that these will serve as a counterbalance to the niche works. As I move forward, I have a lot of questions about this research along with a lot of intentions. I'm curious about what it means to bring bootlegs of various types together into one curated space. I find myself most excited about the works that careen one way or the other outside of the expected. I'm excited about the possibility of amassing enough of these thieved works to generate conversations around authorship. Where does my genius as an artist begin and end? And where does the collective knowledge bleed into that? Here's another bootleg from my residency. Um, one of the first days actually that I was in Baltimore, I saw this chunk of painted rubber on the ground and it, the one that kind of has these sort of winged forms and instantly thought of Amy Tavern's work, specifically these iconic painted shapes that she used to feature often. Um, I was called to make this necklace around the found detritus. The chain is repurposed, painted with spray paint, the setting is sterling silver and the long articulated chain is in copper and then the painted wings are sandblasted steel. As this research continues, I know there are many more layers to uncover. For instance, how do power dynamics play into this? There's also the complicated issue of discerning this work from merely homage or appropriation, um, which day to day, my answer changes to that, but today, um, my answer to that question is that using the term bootleg, I'm aligning the work to a history that I'm intrigued by. Um, it is a history where people generated access through outright thievery. Uh, those things or ideas that come close to an edge of discomfort that create discussion um, that feel prickly and maybe even wrong are important to acknowledge, honor, and be under critical scrutiny, in, in my opinion. I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. Some of this information is a little dense. Um, and I, again, have to acknowledge that this work is still under construction. So feel free to ask questions that you might have. Just know that I reserve the right to say that I don't know or that I'm not there yet. Um, thank you for joining me. And thank you again to Shane and Elliot and the BJC for this awesome opportunity. Yeah. Our time. Okay, now we are going to transition into checking out Sarah's pop up exhibition. So if you're joining via Zoom, just hold for one second and we'll 
We're gonna move into the into the exhibition space. Oh, look at all these friends. Hi, everybody. Oh. Um. No, I'm gonna take my. All right, Sarah. Hey. Okay. What? Uh, here's the exhibition. What do I do here? Talk to us about your. I mean, the display is really different from what you. Uh, so you want to talk about the display? A little well, bit? I wanted to use the display here as a as a way to bring like a bite of the bigger installations that I've did that I've been doing into these kind of like small vignettes, and so. Um, I used everyday objects um, to try and um, house these jewelry objects, bring them into an interesting context. Um, so we've got spoons here, big rubber bands. Um, and then I'm just like kind of um, adorning all of these weird objects. This is, these are books. There's my um <laughs> you can't see it, but there it is. There's my uh I'm not gonna call it what I call it. Okay. <laughs> um these things. <laughs> um, We've got all the little um rings and bootlegs here. If anyone joining via Zoom or in person has questions, I mean, you can either speak out loud or uh, unmute yourself, or if you'd rather, you can put it into the chat and I'll um, repeat it for everyone. So it's the Amy Tavern one. That's a doorknob. Yeah. Sarah, can you talk a little bit about um, your uh, display and what you were thinking? Because this is very different than what you're, what you were norm, what were you doing before? Like it's a lot less stuff and more. Sense. I know. <laughs> I know. I'll, it's it is a little different for me. Um, so that's one thing that I've been working on this last few months is trying to kind of like pare back. I think. Uh, in installations in the past, my jewelry has gotten really um, lost in the space, which I, there were parts of that that I liked and then parts of that were, that were, I don't know, I, frustrating. So this is a different way that I'm trying to integrate some of these like other objects and um, found materials and things in a way that allows the jewelry to also um, like shine a little bit. I feel this like is also a jewelry space. This is a jewelry center. So I didn't, you know, want to do a huge installation. I wanted to focus on the jewels. We also have to be uh, ADA compliant in this whole <laughs> way. So um, that's another restriction being like, it's, it's, it's a multi-use sort of area. Um, we have another question from Allison. Uh, have you ever interfaced with an artist you've bootlegged? Have you ever met someone you've bootlegged? Yeah, I have. You want to talk um, about that? <laughs> this is uncomfortable work for a lot of people, and um, I've had um, I've had other jewelers who have expressed their discomfort about. They weren't um, necessarily taught. It wasn't someone that I had bootlegged their work. It was someone defending another person's work, but. Yeah, I have a little bit chatted about that. Um, I think when you, my hope is that when you see that there is a variety of bootlegs that I'm not um, thieving from one person alone, that it starts to generate conversations beyond just um, this singular artist. But um, yeah, I have interfaced a little bit. Does that help? Did, was that a good <laughs> answer? Did have a follow -up? Any follow-up? <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Along those lines, Sarah, 
thinking about how oh, I have a follow-up. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. What's your follow-up, Christine? Or Gabrielle? Gabrielle, go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, my follow-up question is, um, I know you had started to have those conversations and I'm wondering as you make future work, will you um, be bootlegging with the intention of particularly having conversations with a particular artist? Yeah. Or how do you think you're like forming, as you're getting towards those conversations, how do you think, well, like, yeah. the conversation come first or the work come first? That's definitely next in, in this journey. Like I wanna start having, I wanna start interviewing people about their feelings about it. I wanna start talking to artists about their understanding of um, ownership or authorship, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's, co that's coming down the drain, but where I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Uh, Say any other question? Yeah, it's about how, uh, you know, being that the work is referential, yet it's referencing something that's so niche. How do you expect people who don't know anything about contemporary art to interact with the work? Okay, so the question is, how does Sarah expect people who aren't as familiar with art jewelry to interact with an idea like this, right? Yeah, well, my hope, and so part of that was, the way that I use materials was I hope to bring um, at least to make the works more affordable. Um, so that's part of it. But um, also a lot of these are the way that I'm installing them hopefully feels relatable. Um, like kind of like there's an intriguing thing that's happening here that's outside of just jewelry. And that's part of my hope. Um, or it could be art jewelry for art jewelry. Well, definitely, definitely it's like nerdy jewelry for jewelry people, for sure, for sure. But I'm hoping that there are ways that I'm at least like creating these inroads, however narrow they might be. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, even though the work feels so much with the leg, because I think because you're in a school, for example, mm -hmm. you have the, like the legal protections of um, like the absence of copyright due to academic research. Mm -hmm. How do you think that process relates to the idea of a bootleg? Like, am I a real bootlegger because I'm protected by the institution? No, not. I'm not questioning your reality certainly at all, <laughs> but. How do those ideas relate and how, you know, what do you think about them? Yeah, I mean, I am, I'm, um, I'm interested in, like, it feels dangerous as I'm embarked or like exiting school. Like, it feels like the stakes are higher, that's for sure. Um, but again, you know, I, I think that a person that interacts with, say, an Aiden Tavern work. Like, I think that they would know that, like, this, it's close, like, it rips, but it's not Aiden Tavern's work. I'm like, maybe I'm not even answering the question. I guess it's like, do you um, feel like you're losing the safety of the, of the institution in order to do this work when you leave? Yeah. You know, like, as a pie, like, as like a bootlegger uh -huh. um, taking uh -huh. advantage of like the, the safety, the safety under yeah. the larger yeah. bootlegger, like you know, how do you? Okay. Yeah, how, how do I do you that? that? It's a it's a great question. I you know I also like this is really interesting research for me during school, and not to say that I won't continue on this journey, but I also have a lot of my own ideas, and so as this has been such a, an interesting exercise in acquiring new skill sets. And um, and really nerding out about some of my favorite jewelers, you know, I have things that I want to say that are outside of the realm of this. So I'm not sure how long the bootleg. I'm not sure how long I'm gonna be on the bootleg train. I guess I should say. Um, I I don't want to 
be sued. I don't want copyright. It, like that just sounds like a total headache and, and terrible thing. But it's been an interesting like academic study. Yeah. I had a question about that. Oh, go ahead. Um, so uh, one thing I feel like the thing you're doing that is very like bold is being honest, but like especially seeing in the presentation the things you're referencing. Um, I mean, even some of those references are referencing the other things on the page, you know, I feel like all artists do what you're doing. Um, but in I guess what is your work more of a bootleg or is it a master study type thing? Because bootlegs, I mean, usually that refers to also how it's being sold, you know, cause it's like being sold outside of the traditional official channels, you know, backdoor sales and things like that. And so is there like, a plan on how to sell these differently than the normal places? Or is it, because um, otherwise it, I feel like using the term bootleg is kind of saying your work is in the real work where it really feels authentic and very much of, of its own, you know? And so could it, is it even a bootleg? Mm -hmm. I, the way that I'd like to sell the work, at least the way that, I'll be presenting the work will be outside of um, a traditional gallery setting. So it wouldn't necessarily be sold in the way that traditional art jewelry would be sold, I guess. So it will, won't necessarily exist in that same way, but I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that it will be out of a trunk, for example, on the street side. I have, it, that's a great question. That's one that I've come up against. I, I also am not entirely sure that I'm how much I feel comfortable about selling some of these bootlegs that tread really close to other people's designs. And so I'm sorting through that. Like that's, I'm, it's a fraught feeling and conversation that I'm having in my own work, but um, it's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the more that you share images, any artists, mm -hmm. the more our culture becomes like dependent on images. Like there becomes less and less original ideas related to the Jim Jarmusch quote. There's like- yeah. Well, one thing in this, in the jewelry world, I don't think that we're having enough conversations around, um, I keep on saying authorship because that's what it feels like. There are certain things that certain jewelers feel like they own like a certain technique and that's their technique. And I don't necessarily agree with that existence. So these bootlegs are, are pushing that button and saying like, is that how this is supposed to work? I intend them to be more that like pushing back in that way rather than like, um, providing me with supplemental income on the side of the street. Yeah. Do does that was that good, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it totally makes sense. And I mean, as a person who doesn't know a ton about um, art jewelry outside of you and Elliot's work, <laughs> um, I I see the stuff and I I'm like. I see yours as completely original, even though I see that it's referencing uh, another artist's work. But I mean, I feel like all artists do that. And the bold thing you're doing is stating your sources and stating like you have a bibliography of who you're referencing. And I think that's, I mean, honestly, powerful where, I mean, you look at any medium like fashion, painting, sculpture, ceramics, all of these, everyone starts with, it is the Jim Jarmusch quote, but everyone starts with a reference. And I think using the term bootleg almost like puts you a step behind the real, because there's a, that saying that there's a real and then there's subversive one, which usually the bootleg, that's, it's this, it's, 
subverting the means of capitalism where um, I don't think maybe, the, or it doesn't seem like maybe that's what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Is an interesting thing to look at. I mean, it, when, I, when I was seeing the exact references, it made me think of like in painting, when painters do master studies to learn okay. how. Yeah. yeah. Which they do a lot in the craft world. Like you study under this artist and then you recreate in that way. And so you're a part of a lineage of makers trained through a certain group of people. So it works in a similar way. I just don't know that there are as many conversations in but but maybe there are, and I just haven't tapped into them, but I haven't heard of so many conversations, at least in the art jewelry context that are being had around that. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about like why bootleg? I mean, cause I think that that word, when we have talked before, I feel like the bootleg sort of came um, because of the histories behind it and like the information, you, you touched on it a little bit in your slideshow, but because I think like I don't think it's I think a lot about your work too is not a one-to-one -one, right it's not like it's all this or it's all that I think that there's a lot of um you're taking words and then you're like using them in a way that talks about those things but then um using your own twist so can you talk a little bit about why you one, yeah go ahead Christine oh no just like why you came to bootleg because I think that's an interesting like part of this too. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, I like the history of the term bootleg and its relationship with be free, um, which that's interesting to me, but also there's an attitude associated with and a culture associated with bootlegging or multiple cultures. But especially like, I think back to people sitting outside of concerts that they couldn't go to and having their tape. Like I, there's a culture that I'm trying to relate to. And in the installations, my hope is that there's like that, a sense of that culture, like you're sitting almost in a flea market and there's so much happening and you're like queuing into different interesting objects and things and some things are valuable and some things are less valuable. So there's a bit of me just wanting to have that kind of attitude associated with the work does that get that gives another like layer or perspective yeah cool i'll say, I'll say real quick uh <laughs> the when you've talked about this before and looking at the work it really feels like the artist is a bootlegger in spirit but to me the pieces aren't bootlegs you know because it, it makes me think of i mean even further back beyond like where you and Elliot met, you know, what bootlegging means to that region and places like that. I feel like in spirit, you're a bootlegger for sure. But I think the artwork are 100% real. Yeah, well, and the thing is, is I think some of them are, I, I've created like a continuum from, I mean, I, I don't know that everyone would agree with that some of the works that I've made are, I think the artist might be like, that's a bootleg of my work, or maybe even a knockoff, depending how fun that is. Yeah, 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 exactly. Counterfeit, yeah, all of these terms have been like swirling. And the way that I described it once when we were talking was like, if all of these terms were like kids on the schoolyard, I like the bootlegging kid because he's like under the bleachers smoking a cigarette and like he just I like the attitude of him but I also think knockoff and counterfeit is more legible yeah and it's more like yeah 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 it's more legible yeah well and one thing that I found is like just in the way that I have had to be kind of and this isn't necessarily my personality but to like take a stand and be like this is bootleg I like I have to keep on defending it and otherwise I'll be wishy-washy and it becomes all these other things but I don't know one thing that I've learned in all this theory I've been reading like there's a ton of like white dudes who just are like well this is the new term for archiving 
<laughs> well, I can't be like this is a new term for boob sucking. I don't know. I mean, it's a silly. I mean, I think you. Uh, it's a little bit of an argument. It's not out of the right term because for me, bootleg, um, like really thinking about uh, like uh, people who steal musical recordings, like make music recordings that are not sanctioned by the artist or whatever, is that there's like a change in materiality or resolution. Like I think the Lynn Batchelder bootleg is like dead on because it, it's it's aesthetically similar but materially made a shift mm -hmm. and counterfeit or knockoff really tries to pretend to be the thing and pass itself off yeah a bootleg doesn't a bootleg is like lower res mm -hmm. it's like a little funky mm -hmm. so i mean i i think like in the lynn piece you're you're doing it and then some of the other pieces they're too they're they're maybe too close like you have to yeah. exaggerate the resolution loss or something totally like here <laughs> and that's yeah. what i'm hoping to do is to like like i wish i could have had these ready in time i had some peter balcus um rings that i made in plastic but i couldn't get them exactly right and wasn't ready to show them but like i think the material shift into something that's more pedestrian i think that's exactly the direction i'm interested in moving in yeah. These weren't quite yet, like these are sort of different iterations on this journey towards that later thing. I think it's also like an interesting um, quirk of our field. And there's like, a, a, I think that you're right that there aren't very, like, our field is not comfortable having this conversation. The, the ownership thing is like really gnarly in our field in a way that it's like we haven't grown up, we haven't yeah. like gotten over it. And where art has definitely gotten over it. I was going to say, Jason is saying that like taming. Yeah, as really a field has like, that conversation no, openly. It's, it's fine. I mean, it's an erased tuning. Like, okay, now you take somebody else's thing. And you're like, yeah. But in art jewelry, I can think of a number of private conversations that I've had where people are like, oh, that work looks like that work. I mean, yeah. I've seen it in public. Yeah. Like, I mean, Teresa, like, went right. after Lynn and, you know, or blow up. So. Yeah. 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 So, two things. One, maybe, you know, again, you, you like set out to do this and you pull it through like before you started. Mm -hmm. So maybe as the pieces have emerged, some are just like Carrie Ann said, closer to the way, maybe some are closer to the content. Mm -hmm. But to link it back to the question I asked earlier about like how non-art jewelry people associate with this, the counterfeit actually expands the good to a larger market. The knockoff yeah. makes people who don't know where it's from know where it's from. So like sure. there's potentially the element of well, this is a, a, a point of exposure. So it's sort of like we were talking about in some of our conversations, like it, there's just a lot more than mine. Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. That, so. uh -huh. And I love, yeah, our conversations, we had great conversations. Like it's, all of this has been so valuable because I think it's a conversation we don't feel comfortable about having. Again, I'm not a person who makes waves. Like it feels oh, crazy yeah. Yeah. sometimes to start having this conversation. I'm like, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, who donates anything? Has a book or something? And like, <laughs> yeah, like why didn't I do that so, first? So even the act of doing that yeah. is kind of really interesting. Like, yeah, like putting yourself. Well, and I will say, just as much as a master study teaches you to paint like the masters, like I've learned a ton of skills yeah. super fast, moving from one artist to the next in that way. Like, I don't think I would have learned to cast in aluminum, for example. That's been super fun to learn and a lot of the stone settings and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah. Any other questions from Zoom or, of course, in person? Uh, uh. Uh, I had a question. Hey. Hi. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Standing in a dark alleyway. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, I was typing in the chat, I was wondering how you consider or like think about performance in your work, both you as the maker and then also like the audience, thinking of like your installations too, like I feel like they're kind of inviting, but also these sort of um, like altars in a way that you create, like just thinking of some that I've seen at the fab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, performance is a huge part of it. Um, so we talk about in the jewelry world that the art objects that we created perform upon this body that moves through time and space. So that's an element of performance, but also um, in the altars, you know, I, I do hope that people come and are invited into the space 
but the altars, what I started to learn was the altars were for myself. And so it was a performance of my own rituals being um, performed through those spaces. Uh, so they weren't, and they were sort of private, you know, and then I talked about performance with that piece where I cigarette burned. I did film those performances. Andy can tell you they were weird. They were so weird. They were uncomfortably weird. Um, in fact, I think I did one where I like put a sheet over my head and was doing cigarettes and putting them out on my face. Like it, it got really weird. So performance is something I've thought about a lot. But beyond those realms, I'm not sure that I would say um, beyond wearing the object or interacting with the object, I don't know if I would say there's like performance in this way we might think of performance otherwise. Cool. <laughs> Are there other people's questions? Other questions? Hey, I, have, I have a question. Um, my name's Ashley. I've been following you for a while. I just love your work. And uh, I just started my first year uh, at graduate school. And I'm also doing like jewelry and metal work at UGA. And I, 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 I use found materials as well. And I was wondering if I'm like discovering that you have to like defend a lot of your choices that you're making, um, which I wasn't totally prepared for. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any like recommended reading or just sources for like the historic dialogue uh, with found materials that you could recommend or like what inspired you in that way that I could kind of go to. Cause I, I, I like find that I'm drawn to a lot of the found stuff in the same way that you are. So. Um, I will send you privately. I'll send you some readings. That would be awesome. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's nice to see your face. Yeah, I nice also follow you on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I sent you some earrings like a couple years ago from Penland. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Well, awesome. thanks. The talk was great. Oh, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah. Cool. Um, do, any final burning questions? I'm burning to enjoy a nice meal. <laughs> 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 I'm so glad to see all these faces. You did so good, Sarah. Thank you so much for this. This was awesome. Thanks. Yeah. If you're local, come out and see Sarah's work. It will be up for the next yes. month. Um, if you have five dollars or more, go and donate it to the BJC tonight. <laughs> <laughs> our residency, much like most of our programming, is supported by grants and donations. So if you feel generous. It's our summer fundraising campaign. We'd love, we'd love some support. Thanks for coming. It's really wonderful to have such a great crowd on Zoom. Yeah. Thanks for hosting over here. Yeah. You want to say bye? Bye, everybody. I love you all so much. Bye, Sarah. Congratulations.